I am excited to share God's word with you this morning. And we're going to go back again into the life of Abraham. And probably this is going to be our last message on this series of Abraham. Are you ready this morning? Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22 and just hold on there for a second. And uh, as I was thinking of this passage, I was reminded. And if you are anything like me, you probably are not a big fan of walking. 2011, everything changed for me. Last year, this time, around the same time, in the month of October, I was engaged to the most beautiful woman in the whole world. I was in the magical land of Nainital. It's my wife's hometown. And as I was there, you know what? I saw the breeze flowing from the lake. I could feel it. People were boating. Love was in the air. October 5th, 2011, I was engaged to the most amazing woman in my life. And that day, for the very first time, my hands touched her hands. It was, it was the first time my hands had ever touched a woman's hands like that. And I think that's the way sometimes it's supposed to be. Not hearing an amen on this one. But as I, as I touched her hand, something magical began to happen. I mean, I, you know what I was doing? I was walking. I was walking. And, and, and it was a hard walk. It's not like Coimbra 2 race course walk path, you know. This is a hill. And in fact, I had gone so long, my parents were thinking, what is going on? This boy doesn't even like walking. He hasn't even come back home. The slope was so steep. But it did not matter. I was having a magical walk. Well, we come to the story of Abraham this morning. And he was having anything but a magical walk. In fact, for Abraham, it was not even an easy walk. For Abraham, it was the hardest walk he had ever undertaken in his life. I mean, Abraham had his shares of walks. He had his shares of hard walks when he left his home. It was a hard walk, but that is nothing in comparison to the walk he's about to take. Genesis chapter 22. Don't go there yet. Verse 1. It says, and after these things. By the time we come to Genesis 22, a lot of things have happened in Abraham's life. Abraham and Sarah have received their promised child. They called him Isaac, which means laughter. You remember this. Sarah who once laughed at God at the idea of having a child in her age, is now laughing with God at the goodness of God. I love it. I love it. In Genesis 21 verse 2, it says, At the appointed time, Sarah bore a son. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. My God, he is never late. He's never. In Genesis chapter 21, and we find that Abram had to send his other son, his fleshly son, Ishmael, packing away. And that must have been incredibly hard for Abram to do. But still, that is nothing in comparison to what God is asking Abraham to do right now. Are we ready this morning? Genesis chapter 22. Let's read the screen. Let's go at it. It says, Some time later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied. Here I am. He says, Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. As we dive into our text this morning, I want to place before you three principles or three uh, 
highlight three points for you that you can apply to your life. Number one I want to highlight is the unshakable faith of Abraham. Can I hear an amen this morning? The unshakable faith of Abraham. I think those three words, go, take, sacrifice, must have taken Abraham's breath away. Can you imagine Abraham that night tossing and turning? It's hard to imagine how he is going to sacrifice his son. The child of promise, the one he's waited for 25 years. And now God says, I want Isaac. Abraham doesn't even tell his wife, really. That's what I think. I think if Abraham had told his wife Sarah, Sarah would have sacrificed Abraham before Abraham could have sacrificed Isaac. I asked my wife and she said, it's true. I would have done the same thing too. And I said, it's good to know women these days. You never know. You see, Abraham, it's amazing. You know, if you and I were Abraham that day, we would have probably said, this is not the Lord speaking. This is the devil speaking. Get thee behind me, Satan. I rebuke you. But it wasn't the devil. It was God speaking. And listen to this. Verse 3. Can we go to that? Verse 3. The next verse, verse 3. Hello? Okay. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. See, I want you to get this. Abraham rose up early and he prepared. Abraham prepared for obedience. Somebody said it like this. They said, uh, prior preparation prevents poor performance. See, Abraham could have easily got to that mount and he said, Oh, you know what, God? Jeez, I forgot the knife today. I forgot the fire. I forgot the wood. I guess I can't sacrifice Isaac today. He could have easily said that. Or he could have slept in, tried to make up excuses. But Abraham prepared. He prepared to obey God. In fact, he gathered enough wood. He took the fire. He took the knife. For three days they journeyed. Three days. Can you imagine how it would have been for Abraham for three days? Each step he took would have broken his heart into pieces. Each step he takes is harder than the one he took before. Every time he looks at Isaac, he wants to burst out in tears and he wants to hug him. But he's trying to brush away his feelings aside and act as if everything is normal. Isaac probably had many fond memories with Abram, but he had never seen Abram in a state like this. Abram was unusually quiet. His face was stern. He was long and not even one smile in three days. <laughs> probably Isaac would have asked Abram, he said, what's wrong, father? Abraham almost said, nothing, son, nothing. Just moved on. And Isaac asked one question to Abraham. I think that would have sent shivers down his spine. It would have probably, it's like a bone-piercing question. Now Isaac, verse 7, Isaac looks at Abraham and he's, and Isaac turned to Abraham. <coughs> and he said, Father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. He says, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said. But where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Now, hold on for a second there. For some of you who think, you know, that Isaac is some scrawny little kid who hasn't even reached puberty, is following his dad like the Sunday school cartoon version, you say, Father, Father, where's the wood? You know, Isaac is not like that. Isaac is a man by now. Many scholars believe that Isaac would have been at least 30 to 35 years old. Now, this is my personal speculation backed up by some historians, but I believe Isaac could have been 33 and a half years old. 
Does that ring any bells for you? Jesus Christ was 33 and a half years old when he died for you and me. Isaac was no boy. He was a man by now. That's why Abraham made him carry the woods. Abraham, in a few verses before, says, Isaac, you carry the woods. And Abraham carries the fire and the knife. It's probably a good thing Abraham carries the knife, doesn't give to the boy at this stage. You know, keep the knife, keep the knife. So Abraham and Isaac are going. Isaac asks him this question. And do you know what Abraham replies? He says, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Provide. These are not some words of a man who is in doubt. These are the words of a man who has got unshakable faith. Abraham was not just sugarcoating it for Isaac and saying, it's okay as we're going to make back. Abraham was not lying to his servants when he said, me and the boy will go worship and come back. No, Abraham really believed that he and Isaac will walk back down that mountain and go back. He had unshakable faith. The author of Hebrews begins to take this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 18. Listen to what he says. Hebrews Hebrews 11 verse 18, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Did you get that church? This is amazing. This is powerful. Instead of reasoning with God, instead of bickering with God, instead of pleading with God for his son Isaac, Abraham, he just believed. See, when God told him his plans for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham intercedes with God. He says, God. But when God tells him, Abraham, sacrifice your only son Isaac, Abraham just obeys. That's unshakable faith. Instead of focusing his energy on the negative, Abraham focused his energy on the positive. You know what you and I do many times? Instead of believing that God can, we come up with all the reasons why God cannot. Why God will not, why God should not. We begin to spend our time researching and researching why God cannot do a miracle in my life. I heard the story of a preacher who was sharing some amazing testimonies of how people were healed from cancer. And at the end of his service, one woman walked up to the preacher, grabbed his arm and said, That was a powerful testimony, preacher. But you don't understand my situation is different. She said, I have a rare form of cancer. She said, I've researched. I've Googled it. Do you know that only 1% of people who have my type of cancer live? And she began to say all the people who died who had her cancer. And she went on and on why God could not heal her. In fact, when she was done, the preacher was also convinced that God could not heal her. That's how sometimes we are. We spend so much time researching. Listen, some of you know too much. You're researching and researching why God can't help you, why God can't do that. I was sharing a story in our leaders meeting yesterday. There was a guy who was about to sh- jump off a bridge, and another guy walked behind him and said, don't jump, don't jump. Tell me your problems. I can help you. For three hours, the man told him his problems. After three hours, both of them jumped off the bridge. See, some of you are like that. You are focusing so much on your problems, so much on your negativity. Instead of Googling and saying how deadly your disease is, how many people have died in your disease, how bad your situation is, how hopeless your circumstances, why God can't get you alone to be married, why God can't get uh, you to overcome. Focus your time on the scriptures. Begin to believe that God can, God will, and he will do it. Are you with me? You see, Abraham had an unshakable 
faith. The Bible says, against all hope, Abraham believed. Abraham said, even if Isaac dies here, God is able to resurrect my Isaac from the dead. Some of you are sitting here this morning and you say, my situation has gone so bad. My circumstance is dead. I've lost all hope. Maybe, I don't know, but let me tell you something. There is nothing impossible for my God. He is able to resurrect and give life to your dead dreams, give life to your dead hopes, give life to your dead visions. The Bible says, if you believe, all things are possible. Instead of spending time like that, begin to do what Abraham did. He believed. He had unshakable faith. Second thing I want to talk to you about is the surrendered life of Abraham. The surrendered life of Abraham. In verse 9, we'll read that just before we get in. Verse 9 says, when they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham, he's faced many tests In his life. Some of the tests he passed. Some of the tests he failed. But here he's about to face the ultimate test. The likes of which he's never encountered before. God is coming to Abraham and he says, Abraham, take your only son Isaac and sacrifice him there for me. You know something? God sometimes allows tests in our lives To reveal our true character. Did you get that? There's a man by the name of Warren Wiersbe. He said like this. He said in the school of faith. We must have occasional tests. Or we will never know where we stand spiritually. See in other words. God allows tests so that you will know where you stand spiritually. There's a difference between temptations and tests. Okay. Temptations are used by the devil to bring out the worst in you. Tests are used by God to bring out the best in you. God never allows a test if he knows you can't handle it. And here is Abraham. He's facing the ultimate test. He's, God is requiring the ultimate sacrifice. On one hand, here is the love of his life, Isaac. And on the other hand, here is God, the Almighty, the provider. He is torn by his decision for his love for Isaac and for obedience to God. You see, Isaac not only was a special child, he represented all the promises of God. He represented the covenant that God had made with Abraham. Every time Abraham looked at Isaac, not only did Isaac bring Abraham laughter, but Isaac was reminding all the promises that God had given to Abraham. See, when Abraham started out on his journey, when he started out, He sacrificed his present security. But now God is asking him to sacrifice his future security. Are you with me this morning? Did you get what I said? No. This was the hardest thing for Abraham to do. What's the hardest thing for you to do this morning? What's the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? What happens when your will and God's will come into conflict? Will you still follow God because he is God? Or will you say, God, that's unreasonable and just go your own way? See, the Bible says that Jesus one time, he preached some hard truths and some people left him. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he asked, will you also leave me? But Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. See, I want you to get what I'm saying. That it's easy to follow God with all of the blessings. But what happens when we need to make some difficult choices? Abraham was having a crisis of faith. And we also have a crisis of faith when our job becomes more important than God. 
When our girlfriend becomes more important than God. Just starting to preach this morning. Hallelujah. When our boyfriend becomes more important than God. When our relationships become more important than God. When our education becomes more important than God. Can you sacrifice your Isaacs on the altar? You know, sometimes I've had people come to me and they say, Pastor, please pray that I will get a job. And they have been consistent. They were faithful to church before they got a job. And after they got a job, they're nowhere to be found. You ask them, what happened, brother? They say, oh, Pastor, I have to work now. Sometimes I'm tempted to pray, Lord, take away his job. But I don't do that, just, just to let you know. I don't do that. Are you getting what I'm saying this morning? You see, Isaac, in Abraham's life, he was becoming like a little God in his life. Abraham, whose life used to center around God, maybe now started centering around Isaac. God was not interested in the sacrifice of Isaac. For those of you who think God's into some child sacrifice, God is not. He never was. He never will be. What God was interested in is in the heart of Abraham. What God is interested in this morning is your heart this morning. What God was interested in was not some sacrifice of Isaac. What he was interested in the total surrender of Abraham. How far was Abraham willing to go in his obedience and trust? God tested Abraham to reveal his true character. When God tests us, it's not to show him how strong we are. He already knows. It's to show us how strong we are. See, it's easy to come on Sunday and sing songs like we did, all to Jesus I surrender. But it's a little difficult to live it out, isn't it? You know, Isaac, God asked Abraham for the one thing that had the potential to become a little God in his life. He says, give me Isaac. For Abraham, he was Isaac. For you, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's your career, your finances, your family, your job, your education. Can you come and lay your Isaacs on the altar this morning? You know, for God, he wants to be number one in your life. That's it. For God, he wants to be number one. Can you look at your neighbor and say this morning, God wants to be number one. God God is not interested in being number two. He's always interested in being number one. He is a jealous God, the Bible says. Anything that takes the place of God, God says, come, bring it to the altar and sacrifice it. See, I want you to notice something here. God never gives Abraham an explanation. He gives Abraham an expectation that he would obey the staggering command. Even in our Christian life, you know, God sometimes doesn't give us the reasons why we need to do something, but he just expects you to faithfully follow it. Are you with me? Are you understanding what I'm saying? See, this was very hard for Abram, but also very confusing because Isaac was the crucial foundation through which all of the blessings would be released in Abraham's life. And yet God said, Abraham, sacrifice your Isaac. But I want you to focus on this for a second, the surrendered life of Abraham. See, Abraham didn't even hesitate one second to sacrifice Isaac. He didn't even hesitate. He didn't even think about it one second to kill his one And only son. Imagine that. How much he must have loved God. And Isaac, as I said, he's not a boy anymore. He needs no fool. He probably realized by now he is a sacrifice. We see here two pictures, two people, but same response. Abraham is willing to surrender his son to God. But Isaac is willing to surrender himself to the will of his father. 
You see, Ab- Abraham was old. He was weak. He was getting old and weak. But Isaac is young, and he's in the prime of his youth. If I was Isaac and my father said, I'm going to sacrifice you, I would have pushed him as hard as I can and ran fast down the mountain. But not Isaac. He willingly volunteers himself, and he says, yes, father, I'm ready. Can you imagine that? He says, here I am, father. Go ahead. Tie me up. Sacrifice me. He says, not my will, father, but your will be done. That's the same thing Jesus said in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will, but your will be done. Done. Jesus could have easily called on a host of angels and they could have done something. But Jesus willingly surrendered himself to the will of his father. Abraham and Isaac, they surrendered themselves to the will of their father. You know, today with us, you know, what's the number one reason why we don't want to surrender to God? Because we think we know what's best for us. We think we've got our life figured out. We think we've got everything planned out. And so we don't want to come and surrender to God. But listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6. It says, acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. It says, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. You know, in other words, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for, come on, they are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. One more scripture, Isaiah 55, verse 8, it says like this, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. That's the will of God. See, when Abraham began to tie Isaac, when he began to put that twist, that knot, that bind, what was happening, something was dying. Abraham's ways were dying and God's ways were becoming alive in his life. Abraham was sacrificing his vision, his hope, his dream, his future, his security on the altar. This morning I want to challenge you church that we do the same thing. That we come and we bring our Isaacs, our dreams, our visions on the altar today and let God resurrect them. God proved to Abraham that he is still the source and that he is in control. Can I hear an amen this morning? Do you receive what I'm saying this morning? And lastly, we come to the, to the third part. And Jehovah Jireh is the provider. We come to the climax of the story. And we'll read verse 9 and we'll, and we'll read verse 10. Come, Sam. I like you very much. Come. Come, come. Here. Lay down. Lay down. And we come to the climax of the story. And Abraham is there. This is a real knife. Abraham is there. His hands are trembling by now. His forehead is sweating. His face is filled with tears. And he draws his killing knife ready to kill. But then he hears the most welcomed voice. Says God's angel says, Abraham, Abraham. And I imagine probably Abraham, he, he fell to his knees and said, God, he says, here I am. And God says, don't lay a hand on the child. Read that. Let's read that one second. Go ahead. And if, and if you were watching this like a movie, you know, Abraham, this is where your heart would have stopped. You think, that's it, no more hope. God's not coming to the rescue. 
And just as his knife is about to come, Abraham hears the most welcomed voice. And next one, next one. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. He says, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He replied. He says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. He says, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son. Here's what I want you to get. Abraham demonstrated to God that he would follow God no matter what the cost. We all say we love God more than anything. We all say, you know, Lord, we love you more than anything, anyone. But Abraham, he really showed it. Don't worry, he's not dead. Even if he's dead, God can resurrect him. Rise up, my son. Okay. Be healed in the name of Jesus. God. Let's give him a good hand clap this morning. It didn't mean that Abraham didn't love Isaac. It just meant that Abraham loved God even more. See, one more scripture we'll read, and we'll get to the closing part. It says, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his. I'm not demonstrating that part, okay? So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. See, Abraham had given God many, many names. But here, he gives God one of the most beautiful names. And he says, you are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. This morning, I want to tell you, church, he's not only Abraham's Jireh, but he's also yours and he's my Jireh. He's our provider this morning. See, when Abraham sacrificed Isaac or when he was willing, all of God's blessings was released to him. In fact, until this time, God said, I will bless you, I will bless you. But when he did this, go home and read. He says, in blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. Your descendants will, will possess the gates of the enemy. You know, many times we focus on the test, but there is always the reward after the test. You know, when we come to church, we sing the songs like, blessed be your name. And we like that part, you give and take away. We sing that over and over again, but we forget there is something that happened after that part. See, he gives and he takes away. But after Job passed that test, the Bible says that God gave him double of everything he had lost. When you pass the test, God will release his blessings in your lives. Can I hear an amen this morning? See, my time is almost up. But this chapter cannot be read without the implications of what it means to us as Christians. You know, this is a prophetic story. What God did not allow Abraham to do. What God was so kind to not allow Abraham to do, God did one day. He sent his son, his only son. He surrendered his son, the son he loves very much to die for you and for me. Abraham's story is a typology. Abraham's test one day will become the ultimate test of God's love for us. God's love is very real. The Bible says, Romans 5, 17, And he who did not spare his only son, how much more will he not graciously give us all things? God did not even think twice about sending his son to earth. See, we read the story and our hearts are touched, but the Bible says there is also another only son who came to the same Mount of Moriah. He was also bound, but he also did not resist. This only son, this time his death was not stopped. This son's name is Jesus Christ. And he died for your sins and in my sins. Are you with me this morning? You see, Mount Moriah. 
Moriah holds a very important place in the Bible. Mount Moriah is not only where Abraham brought Isaac, it's where Solomon built the temple. It's where he offered temporary sacrifices, but God was watching and he said, I know one day my son will come as the Lamb of God. He will come as the pure, as the spotless Lamb. Isaac didn't die that day because God knew one day his son would come as the Lamb for Isaac's sin. And his Lamb not only took Isaac's place, but he took your place and he took my place and he came as the Lamb of God and he was slain for the sins of the world. And the Bible says that Jesus is the answer that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but they shall have everlasting life. Jesus is God's provision my friends. He is the lamb. He is the one God provided. He is the perfect atonement. He is the lamb that God sent to earth. Listen to me. Jesus is the only way to the father. Jesus is the only way to be saved. He is the only way to be heaven. Apart from him there is no other way to Jesus Christ. You don't have to climb a mountain. You don't have to do good works. All you have to do is call on the name of Jesus. He is the lamb who was slain for your sin and my sin. He is the lamb who took your place and he took my place. Abraham looked up and says the ram was near. The provision was near. And the Bible says God's name is near. It says call upon his name and you will be saved.